Hello, everyone. Welcome to another uh, episode of the Podcast Boys, where I am joined by Connor Nielsen. Connor, how are you doing today? I am doing very well. How about yourself? I'm doing just fantastic. Uh, today, uh, we are talking about uh, something that is connected to Twin Peaks, which we always do with this podcast. Uh, we talked about every episode of the series, and we talked about the movie, and so now we're talking about movies and TV shows that have uh, connections to Twin Peaks alumni. Uh, in this case, we are talking about the movie The Natural. Connor, why don't you tell us a little bit about the movie The Natural? The Natural is a 1984 sports drama fairy tale directed by Barry Levinson. Uh, the Twin Peaks connection is not in the cast uh, as it usually is uh, when we talk about one of these movies or TV shows. Uh, the Twin Peaks connection is cinematographer uh, Caleb Deschanel, who directed three episodes of the original series of Twin Peaks. He directed the second to last episode of the first season, he directed the episode after the reveal of the killer, but before the wrap-up of the murder like saga of Twin Peaks, so that, that, I think, eighth episode of the second season. And then he directed one of the bad episodes. Uh, that one was called The Black Widow. That's the one that introduced uh, Robin Lively as mm -hmm. uh, the lady. Anyway, so he directed those three episodes, um, but he's not by... Tr like, I mean, he has directed a lot of television episodes, but he... Uh, he is probably most well-renowned as being a cinematographer, and this is one of his most um, championed efforts. But the cast here uh, is Robert Redford, uh, Robert Duvall, Glenn Close, Kim Basinger, Wilford Brimley, uh, Richard Farnsworth, Joe Don Baker, Michael Madsen, Barbara Hershey. Um, it tells the story of Roy Hobbs, who was a, a, a potential like baseball star this takes place in the like 20s or 30s or sometime when baseball was america's pastime and he has he sustains an injury from a mysterious woman and then he disappears for 16 years and then in his middle age comes back to the sport and starts to make it big but as he's doing so uh, on the the uh, new york knights baseball team which is this lowly uh, kind of struggling major league team. Uh, he starts to rise in their ranks and the team itself begins to rise in the ranks of the major league baseball. But as he does so, there are these moral obstacles that are presenting themselves in the way of bookies and uh, media people and mysterious women and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so is uh, Roy Hobbs going to be corrupted by the uh, business or is he going to stay true to the purity of the game. That's sort of the central conflict, central story of The Natural. Um, Comics Kid, how did you feel about The Natural? Uh, this is the best Superman movie that I've ever seen. Um, this, <laughs> this is very much a, like, there's some even very specific plot points that I'm like, this is Superman, but this is about... Uh, a good-hearted, decent person who is going to bat, uh, pun not intended, against the forces <laughs> of evil, and uh, he's able to, through sheer force of will, uh, kind of make uh, these people who are kind of living in uh, the shadow of depravity kind of, you know, help them pull themselves out of it. Uh, he's able to influence uh, the darkness and make it a little bit of a brighter place. And uh, I like this movie. Uh, I didn't think I would. Uh, I am not, uh, I, I don't follow baseball. I don't really watch sports movies. Uh, but uh, I found myself really entertained by this. Uh, it's kind of gingerly paced. Uh, it's a hair over two hours. I think it could have been shorter, but uh, I enjoyed watching this. Um, and uh, I... Uh, don't think that I don't know if I would watch it again. This might be one I would watch like every three or four years. But you know, I I think I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah, baseball is not a sport I follow. Um, what sports I do follow is, you know, I live in Portland, Oregon. So every so often I'll check in on the Portland Trailblazers, which are a basketball team, uh, and that's about it. <laughs> I'll watch the Super Bowl every year. Um, I I think I'm just too antsy of a viewer to watch sports because I just get way too into it while I'm watching them and it's like if I commit three hours of my evening to a game and my team loses it's like what's even the point <laughs> you know what I mean like that's sort of my uh my thinking when it comes to sports because I do respect the athletes and like the the amazing physical skill it takes to be good at a sport 
and uh, and so I do like the game element of it. It's just the time commitment and the like the, the what that's going to feel like when it, when when the team I want to win ends up losing. Uh, and I've but I've never been much of a baseball person. But the uh, like kind of the the myth of baseball, you know, it's America's pastime. I grew up so far after that fact. Like I sometimes have to remind myself that baseball is even still a sport. Um, and this does sort of look back at baseball as the sort of like American myth. And there's a lot of allusions to like Samson. Um, they refer to Homer at one point. Uh, and uh, this does sort of, and, and uh, you know, Roy Hobbs is a person who has his own like bat that he made from a tree that was split with lightning. It's almost like this sort of mythic origin story for a sort of King Arthur type and his, sword from the stone or his Excalibur or something like that. Um, and those are all sort of thrown in here. And there are these sort of villains that have this slight uh, supernatural element where, you know, the, a woman shoots him with a silver bullet. And there's this man who has this all seeing eye that's sort of this strange color. And there's a man who loves living in the darkness. And so there is this sort of cool. And as you said, it there like Superman, I absolutely kind of got those vibes too especially the ending music by randy newman had a lot of like kind of john williams style uh sort of feelings <laughs> i don't know if you got that vibe from it but yeah i um i liked this movie and i think uh, it's got some problems but and we can talk about them but i think that just as a completely earnest like celebration of like you know almost like naive like faith in the purity of the idea and of like not selling out or whatever like i i didn't grow up in the era when baseball like players were like real life superheroes but i think this did a pretty good job of like portraying you know of like kind of putting you in the shoes of like a kid who might be like following the the legend of roy hobbs yes so I think since we both like this movie, uh, this may be a little odd, but why don't we try talking about the things you disliked about it, and then we can get that out of the way, because uh, I think both of us are probably about on the same level with this, and then we can mostly focus on the positives, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, well, I, I would say that the kind of, I would say, like, it, it does commit to the myth and the uh, the sort of broad strokes, uh, sort of fairy tale elements I would say in places to a fault. Like there's a, there's like the one scene of this movie that I don't like is where Roy Hobbs storm like towards the end storms into the the bookie's office and tells him like I'm not taking you a bribe and and I don't like you, uh, Kim Basinger. Uh, you're no good and uh, the old man from A Christmas Story. You're crooked too. And I'm like all all of you are just conveniently in this room and you guys are the forces who have been corrupting me this whole time. That that whole scene just sort of felt like it did a good job of portraying Roy. Like the movie does a good job of portraying Roy as a myth, but that sort of felt like I needed to see him more as like a man. Mm -hmm. And I never for a second believed he would take the bribe. I never for a second believed he would actually be corrupted. Uh, or if he was, they would, it would be like negligible and it's easily redeemed. And I know that this is based on a novel that is considered like, you know, one of the all time great American novels. And um, that, book apparently does end with him being corrupted and falling it's about the fall a fall from grace of like this mythic figure and this is about enforcing that like kind of mythic quality and so i i'm not saying i wanted to see him get corrupted but um i think it could have been more interesting but as is i still liked it and i think it's maybe worth it because the very end of this movie is one of the most awesome things I've ever seen. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. it's interesting that you say you, you never believe he could be corrupted because I feel like the movie does a really good job of portraying Roy Hobbs as a very wholesome figure, but he is fallible. Uh, early in the movie, before we get the 16-year time jump, uh, he's on the train and he's already uh, shown up the Whammer, uh, who is a baseball legend. I was getting Babe Ruth vibes, uh, but apparently, apparently yeah. he yeah. is not based on Babe Ruth, although I feel like I feel like in the novel he's probably based on someone else, but I'm sure Joe Don Baker was really leaning into the Babe Ruth vibes there. But um, he he's already kind of beaten him in a bet, and then he's on the train and there's a woman who says, like, you know, hey, come to my room at this hotel, and 
he or it, she asks him, "Do you have a girl?" And he doesn't say anything. He kind of just looks down. And so he meets her at her at her hotel room. And so right there, I'm thinking, "Oh, he's he's already showing that he is willing to be tempted a little bit." Uh, and then throughout most of the rest of the movie, he's a very stand-up guy. Uh, he's not easily corrupted, but I felt like he he could be corrupted uh, with some work. Uh, and I, I feel like that's a typical like third act drama. Uh, you know, if we're since we're talking about Superman, like Superman gets the kryptonite necklace around his his neck, and then he's pushed in the water, and then the missiles are launched, and you're on the edge of your seat, and you're like, come on, come on, let's go. And then he perseveres. And so here it's like he he takes the money, and he you know he tells uh, his team, good luck out there, guys. And then you're you're on the edge of your seat, and he perseveres. And so uh, I I was pretty sure i didn't know that the novel he actually does get corrupted i didn't know that but i was pretty sure this was gonna have a happy ending but i still felt like it worked where he almost gives in yeah i guess what i'm saying is that like a lot of roy's character relies on you putting yourself in his position where it's like well of course that he would be tempted look how hot this chick is or of course he'd be tempted that's a lot of money I guess maybe with the women, it's a little different. He does seem to actually kind of give into that, those temptations. But when it comes to, like, the money and selling out, like, it, I, he, he's going this whole movie not, like, like perfectly happy working at, like, minimum salary. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's like, yeah, $20,000 sounds pretty cool to me, but it doesn't really seem to brush him at all. And on the one hand, yeah, that's the Superman quality that makes him endearing. On the other hand when you want to have the drama of, is he going to take the money or not? I, I, you like, I've watched him the whole movie, not taking the money. I don't know why this one would be any different. Um, but, and I, and I think like that scene where like Kim Basinger, like pulls out the gun and then I guess shoots the ground mm -hmm. or, or something. We don't see where she shoots. And she says like, you, <laughs> I hate you. And I'm like, why? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know why the like drama is really like, like that all felt like, it was the payoff to a movie I wasn't watching. Do you think it would have worked better whenever he has a conversation with Glenn Close and she says she has a son uh, and he says, did you sell the farm? And she says, no, I'll always have the farm. Do you think it would have been better if she said, if she just threw in there like, I've got some bills, you know, it, it the bills are piling up. It's hard to, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to sell the farm. Like or something like that, like where maybe he would say, I'm going to take the money and I'm going to help Glenn close with it. Do you think that would have worked a little yes. better? Okay, yeah. Yeah, Not I think, yeah, putting that in a, like a morality context of what a good guy would do with all that money. I think that would have benefited it, uh, certainly. Now that you mentioned that about the money not really being something that interested him, I think you're right. Um, it didn't bother me while I was watching it, but I, I agree with you now. Uh, the Kim Basinger thing, by the way, she looks more like Taylor Swift than Kim Basinger here. Uh, the, as, so, <laughs> as soon as we saw her, I was like, Taylor Swift? Because the only other thing I have seen her in is Batman, and she's got long, straight hair in that. And here, she it's more of a like old-school Marilyn Monroe hairstyle, and so... She, I thought she was yeah. virtually unrecognizable here, but um, I kind of... She looks like, yeah, Taylor Swift crossed with maybe, like, Elizabeth Banks or a little Margot Robbie or something. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, she doesn't look... Like, she looks considerably different than she does in the 89 Batman movie. Yeah. Um, I kind of liked her performance. Uh, I got the feeling that she starts off, she is a uh, seductress working for the forces of evil, but then through no fault of her own she accidentally falls for roy hobbs and she didn't mean to because uh, there's that one part where she calls him on the phone and she says something like you know hey you know I, I don't even remember what the conversation was but then he hangs up the phone and she holds on and says all right i love you too and then she hangs up the phone and we see that uh gus the the one-eyed guy or the guy with the weird eye he's there and he's like oh isn't that sweet haha <laughs> And, but she's faking, like, the I love you, she didn't actually say it to Roy. She just said it, I guess, for Gus's uh, benefit. But I got the feeling that she has come to the point where she wants him to do what the bad guys want, but she does care for Gus. And so, like, when when they're in the hospital and he says, I'm just going to play one more game, and she's like, you're going to get yourself killed, I get the feeling that she's still on the side of the bad guys, but she does care about what happens to him. And so when she shoots the gun, I felt like that was just kind of culminating in her saying, like, 
you know, you are going to get yourself killed and like maybe we could have taken that money and run off together. She's made her choice and she was hoping he would make his so that they could end up together. Um, I don't know, may maybe you got a different read on it, but that was kind of the feeling I got with her where she's like, she's not one of the good guys, but she wishes she could be so that she could be good enough for him. Yeah, um, that's a really cool reading. I guess the, the parts of like that character I was kind of reading more into was kind of going back to like the the mythic like she's like delilah right to his samson and there's it's almost like the the barbara hershey character who shoots him early on take taking on a new form mm -hmm. where before she was coded to look like a femme fatale now she's looking like um like the 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 golden girl right like the good girl in the film noir who's like typically blonde wearing bright clothing mm -hmm. and so it is sort of like the wolf in sheep's clothing and and so that's sort of what I was taking it as. And but like I think maybe if I were to watch it again, um, and I think I will watch this movie again because I did really like it. I think um, that I, I might pick up on on those. Um, I thought it was a weird detail that we say that she is the the niece of Wilford Brimley. Yeah, that was a a detail I, I kind of questioned why that was even included because then you have to have like the awkward part where, where Wilford Brimley has to say, "Oh no, I love her." But she's no good and she's bad luck. Stay away from her. Yeah. That, and, <laughs> so. and when she's giving her backstory, it doesn't include Wilford Brimley. She's talking about how, like, her parents abandoned her. And, like, and like she's – we only ever see her aligned with Gus and the judge. And other than that one scene where uh, she asks Roy what position he's playing, and by that point, Wilford Brimley is still unsure about Roy – other than that one scene, they're not in the movie together. And so I agree with you that I was going to bring that up, that it was really odd. And I wonder if that's a situation where, because I, I haven't read the book, but I have read up on the movie a little bit. And it's uh, reading trivia. It's mentioning some of the different things that it changed. I'm wondering if this is something where they changed something, but then they kept something else. And so you have these kind of incongruous elements working together with this character and her relationship with uh, Pops. Yeah. And I will say, like, when it does sort of, like, stick to the sort of fairy tale, maybe to a fault, like, I think that, um, like, that's sort of the element where it kind of comes in where there are the, like, there are moments where the movie kind of wants you to view these characters as, like, these maybe more, like, dimensional people. And I, I just wasn't really viewing it that way. You know what I mean? It's like that almost felt like too much of an ask. Uh, and, and like, I think, you know, I, I, I'm kind of more of a sucker for the sort of, almost like naively idealistic sort of spirited film. But I, I do kind of, after a, enough time, I was like, okay, but like there, this, the movie kind of expects him to be perfect in ways that nobody could be perfect. And he almost like suffers for like not having, like not behaving the way like a child's idea of like a moral person would behave. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, uh, because it does seem to be that whenever he does start losing at baseball, it's because um, he is indulging in things that are bought with fame. Mm -hmm. um, oh, he's he's with uh, uh, Kim Bassinger, and she wouldn't have wanted to be with him if he wasn't like rich and famous, or like not even rich, but if he wasn't famous. And like, and so it's almost like you have to like be wholesome and stick to everything that you were before you got big. And it, you know, it's like and like I can like kind of de-age myself and put myself in the mindset of like a child with like an idealistic look at like my heroes who are like perfect and they're, they're like Superman. But it kind of reminds me of like, I remember being in middle school and um, like my idea was like, Oh, you, like, you know, Oh, I, I was really into like musicians. And I was like, Oh, that, that musician sold out, man. You know, Oh, that, that musician, musician like lost sight of who they were and sold out to make money to make, basically make pop music, man. It's like, well, as I got older, it's like this, it's a little bit more complicated than that. You know, maybe somebody's musical influences and like intentions and desires change a little bit. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I guess since you're talking a lot about the mythic qualities of the movie, I didn't really pick up on a lot of that. And I'm kind of kicking myself for not, uh, cause reading up on it after the fact, I was seeing a whole lot of like, you know, it's very loosely following the formula of the Odyssey. And, you know, it even mentions Homer, early in the movie, but I wasn't picking up on, like, you know, Odysseus, he leaves his wife and newborn son and goes, and he's away for 20 years. He's trying to get back home, and uh, this is not exactly that. Roy, unbeknownst to him, he uh, fathers a child on Glenn Close, uh, but 
uh, he's eventually, you know, makes it back to her at the end of the movie. Uh, and then you've got, like, King Arthur tried to, you know, uh, create a golden age. And uh, he, he's got the best people in the world working for him. He, he inspires them to be better. And you've got Roy inspiring the knights, you know, not a subtle name for this baseball team, inspiring them to play better. And at the end, there's a great uh, line with the guy who's also on the take, and he says, uh, I'll start pitching right if you start batting right, or something like that. And so, like, I I was still, you know, very much thinking of, like, in my mind, I was like, when was this novel written? Did they did the novelist see the movie Superman before they wrote it? Or was uh, <laughs> did Barry Levinson see the movie Superman? Because that opening scene, you've got the kid, like he's playing ball with his dad, and then he, his dad has a heart attack, and his kid uh, is on the porch and runs to him. And I was expecting him yeah. to say, like, with all my baseball powers, I couldn't save him. <laughs> um, I, and I, I'm, I'm dogging on the movie just a little bit, but it's I, I still enjoyed that. I enjoyed here's a good old farm boy who goes into the big city, and it's different than what he was raised with. I, I enjoyed that. Uh, I think that works very well. I have no idea when the novel was written, uh, but I, I don't mind that I was feeling a sense of familiarity here with that. Uh, and I think I agree. I was saying I was a little unsure if I would watch it again, but I think I, I will just to see if I pick up more on like the mythic qualities, like what you're talking about. Cause like, like you said, he, he pulls a bat from the tree basically. And you know, there that's like King Arthur sword in a stone. And, uh, in, uh, the, the saga of the ring of the Nibelung, uh, the German, uh, epic uh there's a tree and a sword uh, a tree wow a sword in a tree stump uh and so like uh, you've got the kid who kind of looks up to roy and he says like i'll help you make a bat just like this you know we'll work on it together and so it, he's like his squire uh and there's a lot of that that i felt like it was kind of subtle i was so focused on the superman aspects that i wasn't really paying attention to uh, where it was paying homage to like the Odyssey and uh, King Arthur and older uh, mythic hero qualities, but I, I felt like it was kind of subtle. I don't know. Maybe you thought it was a little more on the nose than I did. My my favorite thing about this is the cinematography, and um, I feel like Caleb Deschanel is kind of looking at Superman the movie, uh, and I, I think because that absolutely is an influence because there is like the the golden hour. They're in like corn or like not cornfield but like wheat fields and like everything's kind of golden and there is this sort of like simplicity to it and um what i did like i want to say though is that you know i'm kind of talking about how a lot of this plays like kind of like a broad morality play and i, and I like that i did like the scenes with glenn close a lot though and you know when they, when they get older like there is that's sort of where the the simplicity of the hero in the big city trying to like you know fight corruption or like you know try to withstand corruption um that sort of does give way for something a little bit more mature and nuanced where, you know, they're both older. They never really got married or settled down and, and, you know, both neither of their lives really went the way they thought they would. Um, and I like that a lot. And Glenn Close is, you know, one of those actresses is like Meryl Streep where she's been nominated like a hundred million times for an Academy Award, but unlike Meryl Streep, she's never won. <laughs> uh, and she is like one of those actresses who was like, but I've never really seen her in anything actually. Um, she looks a lot like Laura Dern. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you got that vibe. Like I was looking at Glenn Close. And I'm like, oh, you look like Laura Dern would in like the later 90s and into the 2000s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think when you, you were saying you don't know when the novel was written. I think it was written sometime in the 50s. Oh. But I do think Superman was at least an influence on Barry Levinson. And maybe he, that he was talking to uh, Randy Newman and uh, what's his face? Caleb Deschanel, the cinematographer. Because that does feel like it is... Like, the DNA of that movie, I think, is for sure in this. And it could be, I mean, this may be a stretch, but it could be that when Richard Donner and Mario Puzo were working on Superman the Motion Picture, maybe they were familiar with the novel, The Natural. Because That's true. Uh, yeah, you're right. Pre, I'm not super familiar with Pre-Crisis Superman, but I know in Action Comics 1, uh, it just kind of glosses over the death of the Kents. It's basically just like, they died... He's looking at their tombstone, and then he becomes Superman. Like, it doesn't show details on that. And then it could be that Superman the movie it expands on that, and it could just be an instance of art imitating art. Um, I don't know, because, I, like I said, I don't know what happens in the book. But I, I was very fascinated by that. Um, to tag on what you said about Glenn Close, I think she's good. I think the character's a little underwritten here. 
Uh, I think everyone else has a lot more to chew, uh, you know, to work with here. Uh, and I felt like she, it could just be by nature of this skipping 16 years into the future. And it's like halfway into the movie before they're reunited. And then they don't get, they're reunited, but then they, there's still several scenes in between their scenes that they have together. So I felt like she didn't have as much to work with as everyone else that he was interacting with throughout the entire movie. Yeah, no, you're like, and, 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 uh, I think, yeah, there is like a sort of separation with her and like the, it's kind of weird because like she has a son and she says, Oh, his father lives in New York. And I went, Oh, it's him. Okay. <laughs> uh, that one night where they consummated before, you know, he took off. I'm like, okay. And then it's like, he doesn't kind of pick up on that. And then he leaves. And then it's like the movie just kind of expected you to put that information together and then because there isn't like that big a moment where he gets the reveal. I mean, I think that's what she writes on like a piece of paper in the final game to give to him. Mm -hmm. But like you don't have like that, you know, close up of him going, <gasps> yeah, I have a son. You know, like, you, don't, you don't get any of that. And so it's like that stuff does feel a little separated. I think that just kind of from her performance, she does a good job of portraying like the sort of wholesome farm girl who who is kind of grown up. And like there is a little bit of world weariness there that she's kind of i think is in the performance that she's not that's maybe not on the page um and but. i i will say i did not pick up on he was the father uh when she said that i think if we had seen the son uh in that part i would have instantly picked up on it because the kid they have who's her son who's their son looks a lot like the guy they had playing young uh Robert Redford at the beginning of the movie. And so I, I probably would have put two and two together if we had seen the kid, uh, but I didn't pick up that it was his son then. Uh, and I will say, I wish they had done the reveal a little different at the end, because like you said, it's kind of a middle shot of her talking to the, the guy and in the stands. And she says, his son is here, but he doesn't know that it's his son. And I felt like maybe we should have been a closer up on them, uh, or maybe she should have been talking to the guy, but we can't hear what they're saying. And then she hands him a note and he hands a note to a guy and a guy hands a note to Roy. And then maybe we read the note. Uh, and then Roy, like like you said, zoom in on Roy uh, reacting. Because I, I felt like the way that was dumped on us in the climax there, I thought that was a little uh, clunky. Yeah, uh, I that's like that's kind of really all of like the um, the negatives I had. Uh, like I think like the issues I had were more kind of broad, mm -hmm. where I I kind of did feel like at, at a certain point, like it being two hours and fifteen minutes towards the end of the second act and at the beginning of the third act, I was like, okay, all of this kind of drama that's been accumulated doesn't feel very significant to me because it's kind of relying on me to be looking at this character in a more realistic way when I just don't feel like I am, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I don't believe he is that corruptible. And like I said, the, whatever corruption is there specifically like, you know, Oh, he, he likes, he's, he's a fan of the ladies. It's like, well, the way the movie kind of presents that is, yeah, that's redeemable. Mm -hmm. You just you just don't got to go to bed with Kim Basinger anymore, and it's like okay, <laughs> and it's pretty easy for him not to do that because he can just go to bed with Glenn Close now. So, uh, I did find it was a little weird how, what because the whole time where he was like, I don't want to talk about my past. I'm just you know I'm from here and there, and then like he wouldn't tell Robert Red or uh, I'm sorry Robert Duvall like who he was or like he said I I think we've met before, and he said no. The whole time I was thinking. There has to be something more that we don't know about, like something that happened in the 16-year jump that he's trying to cover up. And no, uh, it's just that he got shot, and I guess I can almost see why he doesn't want people to know that, especially when he becomes like a role model for the kids. But the whole time I was thinking, you got shot. That's not your fault. Why are you so ashamed of that? Uh, and like, you know, Glenn Close even says, oh, you think you should have seen it coming? And he said, yes. And I, I was thinking like, if I got shot and then like 20 years from now I became a celebrity and everyone found out about that, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't care that that became a public, public knowledge. Like I, I, I see what the movie is doing. They're saying like you were in her bedroom and she ended up dying. It's going to, people are going to talk. And I guess maybe it's like, well, people are going to talk because they're going to think you were having an affair with her. And in the 1920s, that just, I mean, that happened, obviously, you know, I think we in the, you know, 21st century have this idea that back in the day that people didn't do bad things. And it's like, well, yeah, obviously they did. Like, 
you know, people still slept around and got divorces. And like, you know, there, there's a song I don't like, uh, Daddy, Tell Me About the Good Old Days. And it's just like, back in the day when everything was good and nothing bad happened, it's like, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. definitely rose-colored glasses there. But like, I I yeah. think, I don't know, like, I, I was looking for something more that he's like, I don't want Robert Duvall to tell everyone about this. And no, it was just that something happened that was completely almost completely out of his control. Like, the only thing that he could have done differently was not go to that woman's room. Uh, and But, like, he had no idea she was going to shoot him. So, like, I feel like it was really bizarre that he was trying to to keep everyone from finding out about that. And it is something that can be so easily, like, you could just throw out, uh, I heard a woman in distress, so I walked into the room, mm -hmm. and she shot me, and then she shot herself. Like, like something like that. And I thought it was sort of interesting that they do present that as like we get an answer to like she like shot herself because the way it's presented at the beginning is like she is almost like a supernatural figure mm -hmm. um where she disappears and i'm like oh i guess she really is just a specter of some kind and then oh i guess she's not i guess she did shoot herself but yeah i i, I will say another thing and i i'm glad i remembered this because it's been slipping my mind but i i uh the Robert Duvall character is kind of set up as this sort of, uh, you know, he's set up at the very beginning, and then he kind of comes back in, you know, after pretty, like, when, when it jumps ahead 16 years, it's not too long before Robert Duvall runs back into um, Roy Hobbs, okay. but then, like, nothing really comes from that character. I, I think, like, they're trying to present him as, like, you, you don't know if you can trust him. Like, he's, like, a member of the media, basically. And there's like maybe oh the the meat like somebody could use him to bury Roy, but like Roy could also use him for the truth. Mm -hmm. But nothing really comes out of that. Yeah, I uh, and I'm wondering if maybe because there's that scene where the judge says like, look, we've got pictures, people are gonna talk, and if we didn't have that scene, I'm wondering if they would have just had Robert Duvall's character because er, like about. I don't know, 30 minutes before the end of the movie, Robert Duvall goes up to him and he says, uh, he, he shows him a picture that I guess he drew 16 years earlier. Or Because at that point, he has figured out that you are Roy Hobbs, who, you know, you outpitched the Whammer 16 years ago. Because he has the picture of him outpitching the Whammer. And he says, like, look, I have this. And then, like you said, he doesn't do anything with that. And I agree with you. Like, if you were restructuring the movie... Or if you were just going to say, let's let every character act with character motivations that they are presented with, then Robert Duvall would have run with that story. He has no reason not to at that point. Uh, and I agree with you. The movie is trying to play him up as a bad guy, and I I didn't understand why. Uh, he's kind of a little bit of a jerk at the beginning. Like, uh, the scout goes up to him and says, I've got this kid. And Robert Duvall's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, but then after... Uh, he pitch out pitches the whammer once. Robert Duvall kind of is like, hang on, I think there might be something to this kid. And from that point on, like, I didn't get the feeling that he was really a bad guy. And especially maybe it's because I was just so hung up on, I don't understand why Robert Redford is trying to cover up what happened. So, but Robert Redford, like, at one point he like uh, throws uh, or he pitches a baseball that like breaks the guy's camera, and he's like, ha ha, like that'll teach you, Robert Duvall. And I was thinking like, why? What, what did he do? And so, like, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, it felt like they were going somewhere with it, and maybe it's because, well, we also want to have that scene where the judge threatens to blackmail him, and we can't have that scene if Robert Duvall runs the story that he has already figured out. Um, it kind of reminded me yeah. of uh, the Daredevil movie, which I don't know if you've seen, uh, but there's uh, uh, not... Uh, Wow, the the reporter character whose name I cannot remember uh, in Daredevil, but uh, uh, oh my God, Ben Urich. Yes, ben yes, Urich. Ben Urich has figured out uh, that uh, I recently rewatched the director's cut, um, and I think it plays a little differently in the theatrical cut. But he figures out that Matt is Daredevil, and in the director's cut, he even tells Matt, "Look, I'm a reporter. I have to run this story." And Matt says, "If you run that story, I'm finished." And so there's kind of this like, "Look, I understand." on both ends they're like we both understand but also like hey please don't do it uh i'm getting that feeling here except like the rationale is completely taken out it's like please don't run that story why uh, okay i won't run the story i uh, like you know i it's just um 
I like Robert Duvall. I've recently been rewatching uh, Lonesome Dove, uh, which is a Western miniseries that he was in with uh, Tommy Lee Jones, and I think he's really good uh, as just an actor in general. Uh, but like, I I wish there was a little bit more for him to do in this movie. Yeah, no, I I love Robert Duvall. I don't know if you've seen the Godfather movie. I haven't. I I have them. I've just never gotten around to watching them. He is maybe my favorite character in those movies. He's really awesome. Um, and he, one of the chief reasons the third one is nowhere near as good is because his uh, he didn't want to come back because they wouldn't give him enough money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so he, so that his character is just not around anymore. And you're like, oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, but no, he's uh, he's great. I love him. Uh, but yeah, no, I he doesn't have like that one scene that you kind of want and you're like why did you get robert duvall for that role then if you're not gonna even give him like that because it's like with richard farnsworth i mean he is kind of like by this point he was a celebrated character actor um i love that guy i mean he was in the straight story um but he uh he at least has like that scene where they you know where wilford brimley is not you know wanting to give roy the time of day so uh richard farnsworth takes him out to get something to eat and then they kind of have like a conversation. It's like, okay, I get why you like Richard Farnsworth for that role. Cause that feels like, you know, it's understated, but it gives him a moment. And that's kind of perfect for that actor. And Wilford Brimley is regularly kind of given attention as like the, the kind of tough, but down on his luck manager of the team. And he, you know, it's like a perfect role for Wilford Brimley. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, Oh great. We got Robert Duvall. He's second build. And he just kind of talks to people <laughs> and uh, in, in these, uh, you know, like under the bleachers or in a hallway leading out to the out to the street or something and that's it so you know how in the movie uh there's the one guy who says like my dad he gave me these uh patches that he had in like world war one and then the next thing we know that guy has a lightning patch on his arm and he starts pitching better and it's like hey this is cool robert redford has like he's inspired this guy he's becoming a better player and then like at the end he tells that one guy don't throw the game and then that guy listens to him it would have been great if we could have had something like that between Robert Redford and Robert Duvall. Like, if there there would have to be more scenes with Robert Duvall, but like you would have to establish Robert Duvall's character as being a little bit shady at the beginning. Like he's a reporter and he reports on the facts, but maybe some of what he's done has ruined the lives and careers of people. And maybe he could have not reported on this stuff. He could have run the story in a different angle, and maybe he wouldn't have ruined someone's life. And then. Robert Redford could be this wholesome influence on him, just like, you know, what we were saying with Superman. He comes in and makes Metropolis a better place by his presence. If you did something like that, and then by the time Robert Duvall has figured out, I saw you 16 years ago and you outpitched the Whammer, and then he, like, figures out, okay, he's the... And then maybe he would have, like, you could say Robert Redford has inspired this guy, and now he says, I'm not going to run the story, kind of like the Daredevil movie, where Ben Urich chooses not to run the story because Daredevil is a good thing for Hell's Kitchen. Because um, there is there is one scene where Robert uh, Red, or Robert Duvall is talking to Glenn Close, and he even shows her the photographs, and he says, I'm going to do everything I can not to run the story. That That's the that's the words that he says, but he's playing the scene like he's a sleazebag. Like, he goes up to her and says, yeah. like, look, <laughs> and he's pointing at it and laughing, <laughs> and and I, I'm like, what is, like, it's like he was told we're going, like, maybe a few days before shooting that scene, he said, like, you know, the script said he's going to go up to her and he's going to threaten to run the story. But then, like, 20 minutes before shooting the scene, they said, change the script, here you go. And so he had been, like, <laughs> thinking about it for these few days, and so he's, like, acting the scene the way he was going to act it, but then the dialogue is different. Like, it, it feels very bizarre. Yeah, uh, it's like oh, I'm going to do everything I can to not run the story. Wink, wink. Mm-hmm. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it is a little confusing. So the cinematography is, like, insanely amazing in this movie. Uh, and not just in, like, a it's pretty. Because it is. Uh, but, like, in a... For me, like, the cinematography, like, kind of elevated the material into, like, a movie I really like and probably a movie I will buy and watch multiple times because I, I thought it was that good. Um, uh, I think our Twin Peaks connection here might, might honestly be my favorite part of the movie. Okay, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, you'll have to explain to me someday, what is the difference between a director and a director of photography? Because that's one of those things, like, I'm not as film savvy as you, and so I, I don't know the difference between that and any movie. Yeah, so um, 
a director of photography is basically the person whose job is to like compose the image. Um, and so like, it, it's like one of those things where when I was a teenager and like, I was like, I thought a director was the cinematographer basically. Um, but that's not the case. Like the director is not the one who holds the camera and tells somebody to move the lights around. That's the cinematographer's job mm-hmm. um, where the director is kind of like the foreman on the job and, and like he kind of works directly with the actors and the director of photography is kind of like the person at the head of the photo like this like the you know the, the camera the lights um all of like how everything is kind of assembled through the, like in the in the way it looks with the camera you know and, and and the director of photography has their own like team that they work with they have a focus puller they have grips which are basically people who hold lights they have camera operators they have all of these people and the, and so that person defers directly to the director the same way everybody else on set defers to the director so the sound people defer to the director the actors defer to the director and the director of photography defers to the director um but usually a director is the person who is um guiding the ship throughout the entire process from pre-production all the way through post-production so um basically the you know a director will sit down with a cinematographer and say okay here's what we're doing i want to have a medium shot in the scene, I want a medium shot. I want this kind of coverage. I want to have this many setups, and I want to light it this way. So do it that way. And then the cinematographer does it that way. And usually, like a cinematographer is, you know, experienced enough, and they'll say, "I have a suggestion. Maybe a better way would actually be to do it this way." And the director can go, "Oh yeah, that's a better idea," and go with that. So that's why something like a Zack Snyder film can look like. 300 and Batman versus Superman, but it can also look like Man of Steel, or it could also look like um, like Army of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead. And I can tell that they're all directed by the same person, but like the in-camera style is very specific to those cinematographers. Where like Larry Fong, who is the the DP on 300 Watchmen and Batman v Superman, it does have that really hyper stylized look to it that doesn't really look like Man of Steel. Right. But mm. but they all kind of have the same cinematic language. There are no close ups. Oh, sorry, there are no establishing shots. It's like ninety percent close ups and medium shots. That's just Zack Snyder as a director making it that way. Um and and I mean I think those medium shots and close ups can look pretty pretty, you know, in the case of like Batman versus Superman, but that's because Larry Fong is a really darn good cinematographer, I think. Um but anyway, that's kinda like inside baseball. But um, <laughs> um, and uh, so when it comes to this, um, I feel like so like when I say the cinematography is excellent, um, I'm giving a lot of the credit here to Barry to uh, Caleb Daniel, um, but obviously Barry Levinson deserves some credit in making the movie look the way it does, uh, because so when you are shooting a scene, you can really shoot the scene lighting wise in one of two ways: you can shoot with natural light or you can shoot with artificial light. And natural light is exactly how it sounds. You use the sun, basically. Um, And artificial light is everything else. (laughs) Uh, Or like, well, natural lighting is like candles, fire, the sun, natural lighting sources, right? And if it's an artificial lighting source, then it's basically a light of some kind. And usually, you know, I, I think there might be like artificial lights mocking natural light. But I think in this movie, when there is natural light, it is like, authentic natural lighting um and i feel like the cinematography in this movie is doing something with natural lighting versus artificial lighting um when we meet the judge he's in darkness he is like has he has a blind shut from the natural light um when you have and so it's almost like the natural light represents the purity of Roy Hobbs like idealism when he like strikes out the whammer it's like magic hour it's like this perfect like hour before sunset the lights all golden you see all the particle effect you know, the particle the like the pollen in the air and it's it it's all naturally lit and it looks awesome and uh as he becomes more corrupt there are more scenes with artificial lighting and that's kind of represented through like the flashes of a camera when they have to put a bulb in a camera and it will flash. Um, and, you know, at the beginning of the movie, all the games are taking place during the daytime. And then as he becomes more corrupt, they're taking place at night. And when it takes place at night, you have to light the field with 
artificial lighting. Um, and that's why I think the ending is so awesome. He hits the ball and it smashes the artificial lighting and it like sends sparks flying everywhere. And the, and, he, and he transforms artificial light into a shower of natural light. And I think that's just like awesome. <laughs> uh, and usually when you do want to present something as this kind of pure, like kind of beautiful, almost like Norman Rockwell style of looking at say a wheat field, you do shoot it at like natural at a magic hour with natural lighting, you know, in, in the Richard Donner Superman, when uh, you have teenage Clark Kent at his father's gravesite and, you know, he and his mom are in the field before he leaves, that's magic hour naturally lit and so at the beginning when you have the opening shot of little baby robert redford catching the ball and that's kind of you know called back to in like the last shot of the movie that's again doing the same thing so i don't know i thought that was all really really cool and that's kind of the thing that I, that's kind of why i was kind of reading in on like the mythic stuff is like oh we're meeting this guy and he's like literally draped in darkness and when somebody does turn a light you know like shine the light on him it is an artificial light source. So it's not really real. You think it's real, but it's not. Uh, and when we meet the man with one eye, uh, you know, or like the, the man with the all seeing eye, it's like they're at a location that's pretty dimly lit. And the only lighting is this um, artificial light source. So I've gone on for a while about that. <laughs> I know that's something that not a lot of people would really care about. So thank you for indulging me. No, oh, yeah. I, I don't really know much about, uh, that kind of thing, that element of filmmaking. So I'm glad that you uh, picked up on that and uh, educated us on it, if you will. Um, was there, uh, what did you think of, I know you talked a little bit about Richard Farnsworth and uh, Wilford Brimley. What did you think of them? Oh, I love them. I think they're great actors. And I think the cast all around the board is pretty darn solid. Um, and I was a little confused with like, what Richard Farnsworth did on the team. Yeah. Uh, is he just the team grandpa? who tells them stories in the dugout or something. <laughs> That's a good question, because he's there to kind of, you know, when Wilfred Brimley starts off as not necessarily a bad guy, but he's antagonistic towards uh, Robert Redford. We know Wilfred Brimley is the coach, but then the role that Richard Farnsworth plays is the one who's not as antagonistic. Like, he's like, yeah, come on, give the kid a break. And, uh, and then he takes him out to eat. And then once we get that scene, Richard Farnsworth doesn't really have much to do. Uh, in the movie, and so I think he's good, like you said, he's he's good at playing like the team grandpa. But I, I, you're right. I I don't know what his role is, and I don't know anything about baseball. So I uh, maybe he does have something that he's actually supposed to do. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Is he like the assistant coach? But in my, uh, we don't really see what he what he does. Um, so what were some of the things you really liked about the uh, that you wanted to shine a light on? Uh. I think we've pretty much covered a lot of what I like. You know, I, I now that we are talking more about it, I really am enjoying the mythic homages that it's doing. Uh, you know, when we talked about the straight story, I asked, is this supposed to be like a modern day version of the Odyssey, uh, where like the journey is what's important and the destination is almost, you know, it's not as important. Like we get there and then the movie just ends. Uh, and you know, this is doing a lot of what I thought the straight story was doing, uh, where it's like these characters are modern day versions of these mythical archetypes. And I am all over that kind of thing. I love that kind of stuff, but it doesn't rely on their archetypal status. Um, a lot of times you will have someone do a story with an archetype and then they will just allow the character to just be an archetype and that's it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's just not good enough. Uh, I want to see actual characterization done with these archetypes and i think this movie does that like i said i feel like kim basinger is a like she's the seductress who realizes she has fallen in love with her mark and i think that's so much more interesting than if she was just the the femme fatale and i, I feel like there's more bubbling under the surface with roy and with uh just about all the characters like even uh some of the very minor characters like the guy who's also on the take at the end i think like, there's stuff there that's really working with those characters. Uh, and that could be Barry Levinson bringing something else that wasn't in the book, or that could be these actors deciding, look, he didn't tell me what to do, but I'm going to add my own little take on this. Uh, so I think there's 
a lot of interesting stuff here and the more we talk about it the more certain i am that i am definitely going to watch this again in the future uh and really just soak in all of that like it's the odyssey it's king arthur it's the volsunga saga you know it's all that stuff just just absorb it all and you know never stop drinking it yeah um oh yeah michael madsen's in this movie uh um, yeah <laughs> he dies in maybe the most hilarious way possible <laughs> that was a situation like i bent down to like you know pick up something off the ground or something and i look up and then like there's a hole in the fence and they're like he's dead and i was like wait what <laughs> And uh, I and then like they're all like it's his funeral and they got their hats off and I was just like what just happened and I uh, and I actually was like the whole time I was like who is this guy I've seen him in something and the only thing I've seen Michael Madsen in is Reservoir Dogs and so he's he looks different here than he does in Reservoir Dogs and uh, I was like ah, I know him from somewhere and I finally figured it out probably around the point where he runs into a fence and dies yeah no um. One of Rasko's favorite actors is Michael Madsen. He does a really good Michael Madsen impression. Mm -hmm. If you ever ask him to do it sometime, <laughs> uh, he always like yeah. You've not seen Kill Bill, I take it then. I uh, I haven't seen Kill Bill. Those are Kill Bill one and two are like the only two two of the only Tarantino movies I still have yet to see. But um, that... he's got a funny line in those movies in the second one that Rasko does a really good impression of where he's like round rocket. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I hear that in, like, my sleep. I've heard it so many times. Oh, yeah. Um, that's about all I had to say about the movie. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, what did you... Did you have any final thoughts on it? I guess not. Uh, it's a little strange. I kind of figured we'd talk about it more, but, yeah, now uh, now that we're here, I'm thinking I, I kind of got all that I wanted to get out of it. I think it's a very well-composed movie. It's put together very well, and uh, it's enjoyable. It's definitely a crowd-pleaser. Uh, it's definitely, like, a dad movie. Um, so like if you're like 50 and for whatever reason you haven't seen this, uh, boy, have I got a movie for you. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you're like a person who's like trying to find a movie to watch with your dad, then by all means, check this one out. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. that would be my, my peak recommendation. I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I say this as someone who does not care in the slightest about, uh, baseball. I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I would. Uh, and so I'm uh, very wholeheartedly recommending it as well. Well, right on. What do we talk about next time? Come okay, skip. so as of now, this movie is on YouTube free with ads. Uh, it's been on YouTube for a while, so I hope that this doesn't get taken down in like the next week and a half. But uh, we are going to talk about the uh, 1990s movie Evolution. Uh, our Twin Peaks connection is David Duchovny, uh, who played Denise in Twin Peaks. Um, I know nothing about this movie. Uh, this is another blind pick for me. Uh, it looks like, I don't know, like the 1990s, like Ghostbusters, but with aliens kind of take. So uh, that should be enjoyable, hopefully. Uh, hopefully this isn't just a big mess, but uh, that is uh, going to be what we'll be hopefully talking about. And if we, uh, if you know, next time we record, if, if we look and it's now off the table, then I will choose something else for us to get into. So, I will look that up and add it to my queue awesome but yeah I, this is one of those movies I've, I've heard of i think my stepmom is a big fan of this movie or at least she was at one point because i know she owns this movie so i could probably borrow it from her if uh if i need to okay cool i, I have it on dvd also uh, i've had it for a few years and just haven't gotten around to watching it uh but uh, i do know if you know if you choose to it is on youtube as of us recording this but uh it's uh I'm kind of looking forward to it. Uh, uh, it looks like it's got a pretty big cast of uh, names that I recognize. So uh, that will be what we will talk about. Uh, and I guess that's it for now. Uh, in the meantime, I am the Comics Kid 2099. I'm Connor Nielsen. And we will see you guys in the future. Have a good one.